that God is one. Though with stones on his chest, his man would not rest. The more I knew that right will conquer all. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon our last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Peace be upon him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is brother James Yusuf Yi and I'm an American Muslim convert who converted to Islam back in 1991 while serving in the U.S. military. We've been discussing my journey to Islam and how I became a Muslim after my childhood upbringing as a Christian, more specifically a Protestant of the Lutheran denomination. The Lutheran denomination, one of the more liturgical Protestant uh, denominations uh, in America. But we've been discussing how I became a Muslim, converting to Islam after being raised Christian and as a young Muslim, being inspired by my first trip to Mecca, something which I experienced as a deployed U.S. soldier during the aftermath of the first Gulf War. It was that inspirational trip to Mecca on an Umrah, a minor pilgrimage, which opened my eyes to the vast diversity that we see displayed in Islam around the world. For me, that was like a Malcolm X-like type experience. That inspiration led me as a Muslim, an officer in the United States military, to want to pursue perhaps one day being a Muslim chaplain myself in the ranks of the U.S. Armed Forces. At that time in my life as a new Muslim who had just come back from Umrah, that minor pilgrimage, there were no Muslim chaplains formally representing Islam or formally representing Muslims that served the ranks of the U.S. Armed Forces. And I hoped one day maybe I could be a person to do that. But I knew something like that would mean I would have to learn more about Islam, would have to learn more about the religion that I converted to, learn more about the faith, and delve deeper into the knowledge and into the spirituality of Islam. I knew I had to go on some sort of quest for knowledge. I decided in trying to become a chaplain in the U.S. military that I would leave active duty. Leave active duty as air defense artillery officer. That's how I was serving the military, in the air defense. I knew that in becoming a chaplain I would have to leave the military and then go and study a little bit. And I wanted to learn the Arabic language. I wanted to learn how to recite the Holy Quran in its classical form, in the classical Arabic language, in its proper format, how to recite the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words. I didn't know how I was going to achieve that or how I was, you know, or what I needed to do to go about learning that. Nevertheless, I submitted my resignation from the military and moved from an active duty status to an inactive duty status in the army. That allowed me to go and pursue some individual studies. I had actually looked into the formal education track to become a chaplain in the military and learned that you really needed to attend a seminary, one that was accredited by Western academic standards. But in Islam, we didn't have a Muslim seminary. We didn't really have a method or process to achieve what is known as a Master's of Divinity or a Doctorate of Divinity so that one could become a chaplain. I was a little perplexed on how I might be able to attain that. I put that idea on the back burner for a while, put it behind me, and instead said, I just want to learn a little bit about my faith, a little bit more in depth learn how to read the Quran. I decided to make the formal pilgrimage. I had made that Umrah, that short trip, that minor pilgrimage to Mecca when I was deployed to the Gulf as a soldier. But now I decided that I would make the formal pilgrimage to Mecca 
the Hajj, something that every Muslim must do at least once in his or her lifetime. I would make the Hajj for the first time in 1993, along with many other military Muslim service members and many of the same people who I knew at the Saudi Cultural Center that operated on the American compound at Kobar Towers. So I went on the Hajj. I went on the formal pilgrimage in, in 1993 for the first time. And in going on that Hajj, I also thought that perhaps maybe I'd find some opportunity to go and study Islam traditionally. Maybe get accepted to the University of Medina. The university where I had met students from America who were studying there back when I made that first trip to Umrah. I recall that when I made Umrah and I had met even American Muslims in the holy city, they were students of knowledge. They were studying Islam in Medina, at the University of Medina. And when I went on the Hajj, formally, I thought maybe I would try and find an opportunity to get a scholarship and enroll in, in this university and start my training and start my education in Islam. For some reason, that didn't work out. I didn't find an opportunity to study there, and I didn't find a way to get accepted to this university. I instead would come back home, get a job, worked in the pharmaceutical sales industry, and after a year, I would then decide I would go on the Hajj for a second time. I made the pilgrimage a second time in 1995, but this time it was different. When I made the pilgrimage this time, afterwards, I found an Islamic university to study in. And that was in Damascus, Syria. On our Hajj trip, I met a brother from Damascus, Syria, who had studied his education, his undergraduate degree in the United States. So he spoke English very well. He was actually doing a lot of translating living in Saudi Arabia, translating many of the Islamic books into the English language, fulfilling a very much needed service. But he was from Damascus, Syria, and he said there would be many opportunities for me to learn there. He introduced me to some other people, and the next thing I found was an opportunity to study at an institution known as Abu Nur Mosque. I got a ticket from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, to Damascus, Syria, and I enrolled in their summer program. They had a summer program for imam training, and I joined that. I was one of only three Americans who were in the English language section of that program. The program actually had an English section, a Russian language section, and an Arabic section. I was one of the very few Americans studying at this institution. That was in the summer of 1995. And when I completed that imam's training course, I would ask Abu Nur Mas if I could then enroll in their Arabic speakers program or Arabic learning for non-Arabic speakers program. I was accepted to that program and I started to learn the basics of the Arabic language right from the beginning, learning the letters, alif, lam, mean, etc., etc. The course was designed to teach non-Arabic speakers Arabic as well as train in some of the basics of traditional Islamic studies. The Arabic language program included classes in grammar, which is known as nahu or qawaid, conjugation, which is known in Arabic as sarf, included dictation or imla, and included like what's known as expression or balaga, and it even included a little bit of poetic poetry meter known as arud. These are some pretty heavy subjects for me as someone who really didn't know much about the language at all. It was a tough time struggling just to maintain a passing average. But also the program included some basic Islamic studies, some basic fiqh courses, uh, some memorization of the Quran, some classes in hadith, some tajweed, courses which taught how to properly recite the Quran in its proper manner. Things like that. 
We had our basic Sira course of the Prophet Muhammad, the biography of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I took all of these basic introductory courses to Islam and the Arabic language as a start, thinking that maybe one day this would all lead me back to become a U.S. Army Muslim chaplain. I spent, for the most part, three or four years in Damascus, Syria. From 1995 through 99, I was also working part-time teaching English as a second language to make ends meet and to be able to afford having a small apartment to rent and live over there. But I was there learning and I felt inspired by this city, by Damascus. Because throughout history, Damascus has always been one of the great learning centers of Islam. There's a tremendous amount of Islamic history in Damascus. There's also a tremendous amount of Christian history in Damascus as well. And I actually had both backgrounds converting from Christianity to Islam, having both backgrounds in Christianity, and now learning Islam. But I was there to learn, and I would gain some insights into the value and the virtue of knowledge in Islam, especially that of the Quran. And I recall memorizing a hadith about learning the Quran, and that's that the best amongst you is the one who learns the Quran and teaches it. This should be an inspiration to all Muslims to learn the Quran and to learn more of their faith. We'll take a break here and turn more to my journey to Islam following this short pause. He declared God is one. Who was the first prophet? Was a prophet the first one to read and write? Did God speak to a prophet? A prophet in a prison. A prophet who commanded the birds, insects, and animals? Want to know more? Join us for Stories of the Prophets. Stories of the Prophets, every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 10.30 a.m. India on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaku min zakhin wa unsa wa jalnaku. Shauba wa qaba ila li ta'arafu. Inna ka mukmin dal wahiyat ka ku. Inna la alimun khabir. O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female. And have divided you into nations and tribes. So that you shall recognize each other. And you may not despise each other. Na tasse patima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. There is no image, no idol, no picture, no painting, no portrait, no statue, no sculpture. There is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, said that I am God or where he said worship me. In the Dina, in the Lai Islam, the only deen, the only religion, the only way of life, the only art of living, acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is Islam. Nashatya Kasich, Janita Jadipa. Of that God, there are no lords. He has got no parents. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is the only messenger whose followers mistook that he claimed divinity. Maqana Muhammadun Aba Ahadim Mirjalikum, Walaki Rasulullah, Waqhatim al Nabin. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the seal of the prophets. Ikkam Prahtam Jyutya Naste, Nena Naste Kitchen. There's only one God, not a second one, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. Jesus Christ peace be upon him said, My father is greater than I, my father is greater than all. I cast out devils with the spirit of God. I with the finger of God cast out devils. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my father. When truth is heard like in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. And Vishanti. Ya Asambutu Mupaste. They are entering darkness, those who worship the Asambutu. They 
are entering more in darkness those who worship the sambuti the bible you have today is not completely the word of god it contains contradiction there are many scientific errors in the bible pas alu ahli zikri in kuntu la talamud if you don't know add the person who is expert add the person who is expert whichever god you are worshiping put them to the test of surah ikhlas kul huwa allah ahad allah samad lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad if he passes the test the god you are worshiping is correct if he does not pass the test it's a false god it's a false god it's a false god he declared god is one bismillahir rahmanir rahim welcome back i'm james yusuf yi an american muslim convert talking about my journey to islam and how i converted from being raised a christian to islam in 1991 and then went on a path to become one of the few muslim chaplains to serve in our us military but we left off talking about how i would make umrah and then the hajj and then finally finding myself in the country of damascus to learn islam and a little bit of the arabic language in hopes that one day i would achieve my goal of becoming a muslim chaplain i was there to learn and i was now learning a little bit of the arabic language learning how to recite the quran this was something that inspired me to be able to recite the quran in its proper form a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين so i was learning how to recite the quran in its proper format in tajweed inspired by the words of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my own personal efforts to learn the arabic language i was on my path i thought to become one day a muslim chaplain i would read the hadith about learning about the virtues of seeking knowledge in islam about reading the quran and blessings that you can receive from it there's a hadith that's collected in sahih bukhari sahih muslim which says alladhi yaqra'u alquran wa huwa mahir wa huwa mahirun bihi ma safrat alkiram albarra that whoever reads the quran and is good at it is proficient at it is in the company of the angels and the hadith the prophetic tradition goes on to say walladhi yaqra alquran wa yatata fihi wa huwa alayhi shaq lahu ujran that whoever reads the quran and stutters through it and is not very good at reading it and finds difficulty in reading the arabic language or reading the quran if they read it they will get two rewards why because they're making a more strenuous effort to read the quran even though they don't have the full capability to do so properly well alhamdulillah for those who can read the quran and for those who find difficulty reading the quran they get an enormous amount of blessings from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just for reciting the words of our creator but no doubt those who are learning islam learning the deen it's a blessing from allah the hadith also state this man yurid allah bihi khairan yufaqihhu fi ad-din the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said whenever allah wishes good for someone he as a wajal meaning allah he gives them understanding of religion so those who go and seek knowledge and gain insight gain understanding by the grace of allah this is a, a sign that allah wants good for that individual there's blessing and value virtue in seeking the knowledge of allah learning one's faith learning one's religion i often read many of the hadith that refer to knowledge sacred knowledge and the seeking of it here's 
a hadith that talks about one of the rewards that you get from seeking knowledge. وَمَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا الْتَمِسُوا فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَحَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى جَنَّةٍ That Allah makes the path of paradise easy for those who go on the path to seek knowledge. Well, alhamdulillah, in this hadith, the Prophet Muhammad is telling us that when you go and seek knowledge, when you go to learn your religion, the reward is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the path to heaven easy for that person. And inshallah, all Muslims, all Muslims will go out, learn more of their faith, learn more of the deen, and find the path to Jannah easy. Ameen. But well, alhamdulillah, I was in Damascus, Syria, studying Islam, learning a little bit of the Arabic language in hopes that I would become a military chaplain. I go back to some more of the hadith about ilm, about knowledge in Islam. And when you go in the seeking of knowledge, one of the greatest rewards is that you might very well get paradise. Because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man kharaja fi talib al-ilm, kana fi sabili lahi hatta yirja. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whoever goes out in seeking of knowledge is in the cause of Allah until he or she returns. And what does that mean? It means you're on the path of Allah. You're in the cause of Allah. And we know that if someone was to die in the cause of Allah, in the struggle of Allah, the reward is Jannah, the reward is paradise. And so one of the ways in which we can struggle, one of the ways in which we can make jihad is to go out and seek knowledge. That's jihad, going out and seeking knowledge. Why? Because when we learn knowledge of our faith, of our religion, it not only improves ourselves, then we can take that knowledge and improve our families, our children. Then we can take it further and improve our community, our locality. Alhamdulillah, this is the value of knowledge and why those who go out in the seeking of knowledge find great reward and find themselves on the path of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us all on that path and seeking knowledge. As a Muslim convert, I'm in Damascus, Syria, gaining from this tremendous tradition of Islam in the city that historically has been known as a great learning center. I was learning Quran, I was learning language, I was learning Islam, and I was fulfilling one of my obligations as a Muslim. An obligation that is laid out in the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who said, Talabul ilm, faridatun ala kulli Muslim. That the seeking of knowledge is a farad, is an obligation on every Muslim. I was trying to fulfill this obligation. I'm in Damascus, Syria, studying and working. And after four years of work and study, work and study, I would apply to re enter the US military as a chaplain. On one of those breaks when I had returned to the United States, I had met up with some former military colleagues and it was during Ramadan. I went to a Ramadan iftar at the US Pentagon. The US Pentagon on one particular day in Ramadan was celebrating with American Muslims in the US military, Ramadan and having an iftar dinner. I attended this iftar dinner met a colleague, a former colleague, who was looking to recruit people to become chaplains in the military. By this time, there were a few Muslim chaplains now serving, one or two in the Navy, one or two in the Air Force, and a small handful in the Army. He gave me an application to apply and become a Muslim chaplain. I took it back with me to Damascus, Syria, reviewed it, filled it out, and sent it in. And in the summer of 2000, my application was accepted. And I was informed that I would become a Muslim chaplain and start my training at the chaplain's officer basic course at Fort Jackson in South Carolina 
in January of 2001. I was thrilled with my achievement. I had been accepted back into the ranks. I had served already in the air defense artillery. But after converting to Islam, went on another path, did some personal studies, and worked my way back into the ranks to re-enter the U.S. military, this time as a Muslim chaplain. I returned to the United States in late 2000. I took the oath to become a Muslim chaplain. And in January, I formally re-entered the United States military as the United States military chaplain. Well, alhamdulillah, this was an accomplishment that I was proud of. And I was looking forward to making contributions, to representing Islam and representing Muslims who serve within the ranks. I was looking forward to educate others about the religion that I had converted to, the religion that I had gone to Damascus, Syria and studied, to the religion that I was now going to represent as a U.S. Army Muslim chaplain. I want to stop here and continue with my journey to Islam in a next session, and I look forward to discussing with you more about my journey to Islam and what kind of inspiration that meant for my life. Looking up at the sky, searching for